For today's story, we discuss the following passage. Winning isn't normal. That doesn't mean there's anything wrong with winning. It just isn't the norm. It's highly unusual. Every competition only has one winner. No matter how many people are entered, only one person or one team wins each event. Winning is unusual, and as such, it requires unusual action. In order to win, you must do extraordinary things. You can't just be one of the crowd. The crowd doesn't win. You have to be willing to stand out and act differently. Your actions need to reflect unusual values and priorities. You have to value success more than others do. You have to want it more. Now take note. Wanting it more is a decision you make and act upon, not some inherent quality or burning inner drive or inspiration. And you have to make that value a priority. You can't train like everyone else. You have to train more and train better. You can't talk like everyone else. You can't think like everyone else. You can't be too willing to join the crowd, to do what is expected, to act in a socially accepted manner, to do what's in. You have to be willing to stand out in the crowd and consistently take exceptional action. If you want to win, you need to accept the risks and perhaps loneliness because winning isn't normal. Hello, everyone, and welcome to One Civil Law, where we learn through the misfortunes of others. As always, I hope you enjoy this legal education content, and today will be the day I earn your subscription. For today, I am bringing to your attention the case of Dr. Keith Bell versus Eagle Mountain Saginaw Independent School District. Dr. Keith Bell is the author of a book relating to winning which includes that introduction that I gave, a rather lengthy introduction for this channel, but that is the nature of the dispute at issue. A school used that passage of his 72 page book, Winning Isn't Normal, and used it without permission. And Dr. Bell is really, really salty when people use this portion of his book without permission. He gets really, really upset when people read or display or otherwise just provide the entire thing without permission and licensing. And so he sued the school district over the, the thing we read because we need to provide you the appropriate context for the legal dispute. So we're going to go over this legal dispute and also discuss, you know, why the Court of Appeals thinks he has no case. So let's get started with this. In 1982, Dr. Bell published his book, Winning Isn't Normal a 72-page book that provides strategies for success in athletic. Bell continues to market and sell, winning isn't normal, through online retailers and his personal website, where he also offers, offers merchandise, including t-shirts and posters that display the passage that was quoted in tweets. And I won't read it again, but I will just display very briefly on screen the entire passage that we are complaining about because we need to make sure that we fully understand this legal context. So this this part that's indented, indented here is the passage from his book. And he gets very, very salty when people display or read or otherwise use his text without licensing. And so we need to make sure that we understand in the context of this copyright dispute, what exactly the text is that's on that that's in the dispute. So it's this text on screen that's on screen right now that he gets really salty about and sues for a lot about times. And also there's a little bit more on the next page, which we're now gonna scroll to, just a little bit more that's further this in further indented portion that that's that's on screen right now is the part he gets really really salty about when people um mention it or discuss it in any way now this entire thing of course is on his own website and on his merch and stuff but he gets really really unhappy when people display or discuss or read or otherwise quote from the entire text that we have displayed on screen for the purposes of discussing what is at issue in this copyright case so now that we are all well aware, having heard it earlier and now having read it for ourselves, let's continue on with some legal analysis. Yeah. In December of 2017, the Chislom Trail High School softball team and color guard posted this passage to their Twitter accounts. 
The post credits Bell as the author, but does not include his copyright watermark that Bell imprints on his own digital reproductions of the Wind Passage. Of course, for our present context, the passage is coming from the confines of a court decision, which obviously is protected by law. So there's that. No one at the school sought Bell's permission for publishing the tweet. Bell discovered them through online searches soon after they were posted. Yet Bell waited almost a year until November of 2018 to notify the school district that two of its social media accounts had infringed its copyright. The district promptly removed both posts, told Bell the mistake was a teachable moment, and announced it was implementing a training program. After settlement negotiations broke down, Bell sued for copyright infringement. Recognizing the suit would turn on whether the tweets were fair use, Bell addressed the affirmative defense in his pleadings, which is usually a pretty good strategy when you know that's going to come up. The complaint devotes a paragraph to each of the relevant four factors. In the copyright realm, fair use is an affirmative defense that can support a motion to dismiss. The leading treatise on fair use observes that increasingly courts have considered fair use on a motion to dismiss for failure to state a claim. As we've discussed before on a motion to dismiss, the court is to assume that everything the plaintiff says is true. So one of the things that you might want to know is can the court consider things from the defendant as part of the motion to dismiss? And the answer is yes, at least in some circumstances. And here is one of them. When there's an affirmative defense that would kill the pleading. Fair use is an affirmative defense, but if it's sufficiently pled out, it can be considered and is considered in the motion to dismiss because we're not disbelieving anything the plaintiff says, but we're also taking into consideration defenses that might bring to end the, the nature that there is a plausible cause of action. Congress codified the Fair Use Doctrine in the Copyright Act of 1976 and listed four factors the court should consider when applying it. So this started out judicially and then became legislative. And here are the traditional four factors. The purpose and character of the use, including whether it's commercial nature or nonprofit, the nature of the copyrighted work, the amount and substantiality of the work in relation to the work as a whole, and the effect of the use of the market. These four factors, however, critically are non-exclusive. It says that right in the Copyright Act. So you don't necessarily need, strictly speaking, any of these four factors because it's possible, although perhaps unlikely, but it's at least theoretically possible that you could fail all four factors and there'd be some additional consideration on top of that, which still nevertheless would bring into uh, a fair use analysis. Courts typically give particular attention to factors one and four, the purpose and market effect of the use. And, and number four is much more um, in play these days, the effect on the market. And that is usually where the whole idea of whether it's sufficiently transformative comes into play, which is also, again, these days, the much more of the linchpin. So in, in earlier copyright law, the, the nature of the work as uh, sort of its commerciality was the more dominant force. So if you go back, you know, 50 years or 40 years or maybe even 30 years, if you go back in law, you know, maybe a couple decades, then you'd be talking about the commercial factor being the most important factor, like whether or not the nature of the work is commercial being the most important factor. But today, in today's jurisprudence, that's not considered the most important factor. The most important factor by far today is considered the last factor, the effect of the market. And that's where whether or not sufficiently transformative comes into play, because if it's sufficiently transformative, then the idea is it's a new work and therefore doesn't infringe on the old work. So that is definitely the more dominant thinking in legal jurisprudence today when it comes to copyright issues. First, the school's use was non-commercial. It's an educational environment. It's a non-for-profit educational environment. Nothing in Bell's complaint indicates the public school district profited by posting the one-page excerpt of the book on Twitter. Indeed, it's hard to imagine how the school could derive any commercial benefit from its use. The tweet's only conceivable motivation was to inspire students to strive for success. So the first thing is, as to the school district, this is not a commercial context. Now, this is actually slightly improper in sort of the legal analysis, because when you talk about the commerciality, of it, you're talking about the original, not the infringer. So the question isn't whether or not the school district is, is a not-for-profit entity for that factor, but rather whether or not the, um, whether or not the original was not-for-profit education. Now, 
The fact that it's educational is relevant to one of the stated rationales for copyright law. So if you go back to Title 107, 17 U.S.C. 107, there are in the preamble expressly listed designated purposes in addition to the four factors, right? So the, the, there are six recognized factors, which I won't be able to tell you off the top of my head, but commentary is one, criticism is another, educational purpose is another, right? So these are some additional fundamental purposes for which fair use is identified. So while not necessarily relevant to that first factor, it is relevant to the fundamental purpose of fair use. So it's relevant in that way, but the court is slightly conflating it although not necessarily in a way that ultimately impacts the analysis, but you know, just to be a little bit more legally precise, always helpful to note these small distinctions. There is no logical theory for how tweeting the motivational message to inspire students would enhance the reputation of these programs, let alone how it might lead to some tangible benefit for the school later on. The complaint does not plausibly allege the school district profited from the use of the work, which is, again, part of the factor, right? That's part of the commercial element but that's not necessarily dispositive in any way. The school's good faith adds up to another point to the score scorecard. The school posted the win packages in quotes and credited Bell as author. Bell discovered these posts soon after, but waited nearly a year before telling the school he disapproved of them. Once he did, the school immediately removed the post and responded to the incident was a teachable moment. It would be sure not to respeed. Okay. So one of the things is here that you're doing it for some sort of beneficial, some sort of like proper purpose, right? What is sort of your motivation in doing it? And again, this kind of goes to the, the six identified purposes of fair use, which are in the preamble to section 107. These are just six that have been ex expressly recognized. So you don't necessarily need any of them, but if you have any of them, it's nice. And here the school district has some of them, right? It has some of them. And similarly to me, I have some of them, right? Because I am quoting from a court's opinion, right? I'm quoting the court's opinions analysis and discussing their analysis in the context of a copyright analysis. So my purpose in quoting the entire thing is educational in its nature. Also criticism and critique, both incidentally of the court itself, because I've already noted one place where I think the court made a slight error. So there's criticism of the court, not that the court has a copyright interest in its work anyway, see 17 USC 105 for that proposition, but also commentary and critique of the underlying work itself and also of its author, who I can point out is being a bit of a selfish turd for, you know, saying that, you know, people can't, schools can't quote it for its motivational value. So like there is, you know, there is a purpose in using the work not necessarily for its like commercial applicability, but as a point of criticism and point of critique, whether or not you're making money from it or not, incidentally, because making money again is not today the dominant factor in copyright law. You go back 40 years or so, it would be the dominant factor in copyright law. But today, whether or not you're making money from it is not as dispositive as whether or not what you're doing is sufficiently transformative, which is indicated by the purposes such as education, teaching, criticism, critique, and so forth and so on as further elaborated by the four factor test. So that's basically what they're talking about there. Bell insists the first factor still weighs against fair use because the school's use is not transformative. But transformative use is not absolutely necessary for a finding of fair use. This is true. It's not. If an expression is not transformative, other factors like the extent of commerciality loom larger and require a stronger showing. The second statutory factor is the nature of the work. In general, fair use is more likely to be found in a factual work rather than fictional works. If it's a factual work, if it's a compilation of facts, then you have what is properly called under law a thin copyright. And so the, the fair use analysis becomes much easier than for a purely than a work of pure fantasy. Constructing the pleadings in Bell's favors as we must, and the court is right, they must do that. The win passage is somewhat creative. The passage largely consists of well-worn truisms. Every competition only has one winner. You can't just be one of the crowd. You have to train more and train better. Athletes will be familiar with them all. 
Still, Bell is entitled to the inference that the school chose the wind passage because it combines and condenses these principles in a particularly inspiring way. The second factor thus goes to Bell, but it's a meager victory. The nature of the work is widely considered the least significant factor of fair use. So yeah, and, and here we have what basically is a compilation of, of truisms, or another way of putting that in copyright law is scenes the fair, right? These, like these uh, cliches of various things. Like, so if you're going to write a fantasy, for example, there are certain tropes that will be obvious. If you're going to write something in space, there are certain tropes that are going to be obvious. And so these troops, scenes to fair themselves are not copyrightable because they would naturally appear in the, in the type of the work. Here, this, this type of the work is to inspire people to be athletic and have victory, right? So these, these truisms, these cliches, these scenes of fair are things that are to be expected in this kind of work. And so the individual elements of that are not really protectable. The third for fair use factor examines the amount and substantiality of the work in relation to the whole. Bell alleges that the wind passage is only one page of the 78, but he also alleges it's the heart of the work. Okay, so this is a fair point of copyright analysis we have to consider. So in copyright law, you not only look at the amount of the work, you kind of look at its importance in the work. He continues or the court continues. That may be true. The complaint notes that Dr. Bell sells merchandise featuring the wind passage and read, readers find it motivating enough to share with others on Twitter. It would be reasonable to infer from these facts that the wind passage is a key element of the book, maybe even the essence of the book or the heart of the work to put it in more proper copyright language. If this were all, copying the passage would be qualitatively significant. So even though it's only one page, it's more than a page because of the nature of it. So it would be qualitatively important. The pleadings, however, also indicate the passage was freely accessible before the softball team and flag corps posted it. The wind passage appears in images that Bell himself posts online. Indeed, the complaint suggests that Bell merely took issue with the post because it was not the generally circularized version. So he didn't take, po he didn't take exception to the fact that it was being quoted, he took exception to the fact that it wasn't the way that he presented it. But it's the same words, which isn't really a fundamental copyright interest at that point. If infringing use enables a viewer to see such a work when they've been invited to witness its entirety free of charge, the fact the entire work is reproduced does not have its ordinary effect of mitigating against finding fair use. So exactly so, right? In copyright law analysis, we're looking to the interest in the copy. If you make the thing available for everyone to see in the open for free, the fact that someone's copying that and redistributing, it doesn't have its normal effect because everyone can see the original in the open for free. So it doesn't really cause any harm to you because the original's in the open available for anyone to see for free. So, yeah. The fourth factor examines the effects of the use on the market for and value of the copyrighted work. We consider actual market harm, but more broadly, whether widespread use of the work in the same infringing fashion would result in substantially adverse impact on the potential market for the original work and any of its derivatives. The last factor is undoubtedly the single most important element of the use. We do not see a plausible economic rationale to support Bell's assertion that widespread tweeting of the wind passage would undermine the value of his copyright. The tweets do not reproduce such a substantial portion of the book Winning Isn't Normal as to make available a significant competing substitute for the original work. If anything, the properly attributed quotation of a short passage from Winning Isn't Normal might bolster interest in the book it is free advertising. And I do find kind of interesting that a court went with the, but it's free advertising, bro, as kind of a rationale. I, I don't remember if I've ever seen that before from a court, but you do see that from a lot of people who are infringing copyrights kind of blatantly, to be quite honest. And they say, well, you know, hey, it's just free advertising. Well, apparently you now have a citation from a federal court of appeals, which at least in one instance found it's free advertising, bro, 
to actually be part of an overall persuasive rationale. So you guys got that going for you, although I necessarily would recommend against necessarily taking that and running with it because it's only part of an overall complete rationale. But, you know, you got something, so yay. Bell also alleges that tweets might impact his ability to license similar usages of the wind passage, but we cannot recognize a theoretical market for licensing the very use at bar. Bell says he offers licenses for the wind passage, yet despite being enrolled in litigation for years because this is not his first rodeo, Bell is unable to allege that anyone has ever purchased a license before posting the wind passage on social media, so no one has ever paid him, much less a public school district which has no commercial interest in online presence. Even in his brief, Bell only author only his authority that such market market exists is his own filing of at least twenty six different infringement lawsuits. So yeah, Bell is a bit of a uh, uh, very prominent litigator when it comes to his super super secret passage that we of course quoted in full for the purposes of understanding this copyright lawsuit and analyzing it against the copyright fair use analysis. Time to tally up the scorecard. The first and fourth fair use factors favor the school district, the second narrowly favors Bell, and the third is neutral. In both number and importance, the statutory factors show the school district tweets were fair use. This conclusion comports with the ultimate test of fair use, whether copyright's goal of promoting creativity would be better served by allowing it than by preventing it. Unfortunately for Dr. Bell over here, this is not the end of the analysis, because in addition to the district court ruling against his copyright interest, they also fined him, they assessed damages, and made him pay the other side's attorney's fees. Bell also challenges the district court's award of attorney's fees. We review this for abuse of discretion. Attorney's fees to prevailing party in a copyright action is the rule, rather than the exception, and should be awarded routinely. The district court did not abuse its discretion by following the normal rule. Bell is not the typical copyright plaintiff seeking a fair return for his creative labor. He has a long history of suing public institutions and nonprofit organizations over de minimis use of his work. So yeah, he's, you know, a bit of a problematic character who's a bit of a jerk when it comes to this. Because, you know, he, he can't he can't get people to pay him for the quote, and so he just winds up suing everyone in sight. So he's a bit of a jerk. Taking these cases into account, the district court reasonably concluded that Bell is a serial litigant, so that is now a finding from a district court that he's a serial litigant, who makes exorbitant demands for damages in the hope of extracting disproportionate settlements. This case is another in that line. Bell was unable to identify any actual financial injury associated with that use, but brought the suit anyway. Attorney's fees were thus an appropriate deterrent, both with respect to Bell and other copyright holders who might consider similar business models of litigation. Therefore, the judgment is affirmed. Thus, that brings us to the end of the case involving the book, Winning Isn't Normal, a book written by Dr. Keith Bell, who in this case sued the Eagle Mountain Saginaw Independent School District for copyright infringement relating to reading a passage of his book. We have read the passage of the book for the purposes of discussing the four use factors under copyright law, and we have also gone through the analysis by the court in analyzing it. And we have noted that the fair use factors incorporate both generalized public purposes slash motivations, as enumerated in the preamble of Section 171 SC 107, as well as four four use factors of which, under modern law, the transformative nature of which is the most important, whether or not it would be a fundamental substitute for the work. Because this work in general was not a substitute, therefore, among other reasons, the copyright interest fails. Also, because he is a serial litigant and the district court and court of appeals seem to be itching, although they don't use the word vexatious, but he seems to be, uh, you know, riding that line. And I wouldn't be surprised if some court somewhere hasn't said it, but not in this case. But in any case that, you know, he just sues everyone uh, for, for using his words, which again are somewhat cliche, scenes of fair, um, tropes of, you know, the success genre. And so nothing pr pretty special in its uh, individual components or really in its totality. And so for the moment, that brings us to the end of consideration of this case. Thank you so much for being part of the Uncivil Law family. 
If you enjoyed this legal education content, please hit the subscribe button. It really helps the channel grow. We appreciate your continuing support. Until later, my friends, cheers and goodbye.